The next item of business is a motion to approve a statutory rule. I'd ask the clerk to read the motion. That the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 4 Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 be approved. Thank you. And I call Junior Minister Declan Kearney to move the motion. Aaron Bidian, Arav Anrun Achor I beg to move. Thank you. The Business Committee has agreed that there should be no time limit for this debate. I now call the Junior Minister to open the debate on the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Alias Kian Korya is a show on Kahru Urgadanig Mehianag as in Tara Lions and Shaw Lakadu and Chonal Eri Dunarela has Shaw. Mr. Speaker, this is the fourth time that Junior Minister Lyons and myself have come before the Assembly to seek its approval of these regulations. As on each of the previous occasions, we have not sought to do so willingly. We would much prefer uh, not to have done so except for the continuing prevailing health emergency. The Assembly considered and approved the original regulations which had been made in March using emergency provisions in the primary legislation. Those original regulations and the subsequent amendments to them have been brought into operation in the knowledge that scrutiny by this Assembly would follow later. The content of the original regulations is, of course, something with which we are all now very familiar. There are three main aspects. Firstly, they impose restrictions on businesses. Secondly, there are restrictions on gatherings of people apart from certain, certain, certain exceptional circumstances. And thirdly, there are restrictions on movement. There are also provisions for enforcement and penalties, ranging from fixed penalty notice to fines of up to £5,000 on summary conviction. The regulations have built in protections to ensure that there are frequent and also robust reviews of the measures. Regulation paragraph 2, clause 2, requires that the restrictions and requirements are reviewed at least once every 21 days. Regulation paragraph 2, clause 3, requires that any restrictions or requirements must be terminated as soon as the Department of Health deems that to be necessary. And those are powerful legislative provisions. Since the 28th of March, when the regulations were first introduced, these have provided the basis for several reviews conducted by the Executive. The Executive members takes the regular reviews of these regulations very seriously and very systematically. And we have shown that we will not hesitate to move decisively when the medical and the scientific evidence and advice indicates that it is the right time to do so. The process of review and consideration is continuous and detailed. And the health emergency, I can assure members, has been kept under continuous review even between the regularly statutory review points of each 21 days. The motion before us today is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 4 Regulations NI 2020 be approved. These short amendment regulations give effect to a particular set of changes. Regulation 3, which deals with the closures of premises and businesses, is amended to allow arts and entertainment venues to provide outdoor drive-in and live entertainment events. In practice, Occupants of vehicles must be from the same household and remain in their vehicle for the duration of those events. Regulation 5, which deals with the restrictions on movement, is amended to include attendance at an outdoor film or live music concert or theatre performance as a reasonable excuse for a person to leave their home. Regulation 6, which deals with restrictions on gatherings, is amended to allow attendance at an outdoor film, or a live music concert, or a theatre performance. Alias Concordia, these amendments may appear modest in nature, but they do mark a small but important step on the executive's pathway to recovery. 
they have allowed, in a very limited and modest but nevertheless allowed families, a way to enjoy some much needed entertainment and in a safe way. The purpose of these amendments and associated relaxation of restrictions is designed to create a progressive and cumulative effect. The executive continues to keep the regulations under review using the three essential criteria which we published last month. Firstly, reliance upon evidence and analysis relating to the pandemic. That will include the latest medical and scientific advice and the estimated level and pathway of transmission. That includes the impact any relaxations might have on the future trajectory of the pandemic. Secondly, the capacity of health and social care services to deal with the coronavirus cases whilst also returning delivery of normal services as soon as possible. And thirdly, the assessment of wider health, societal and economic impacts of the regulations. This includes the identification of areas where we can achieve the greatest benefit and ensure the lowest risk will result from any individual relaxation. Achyon Corlea, via Mursulyar Agoni, we have been clear all along. The executive will not be rushed into making decisions as a result of artificial deadlines or simply to match actions which are taking place in other jurisdictions. Since the regulations that are subject to today's debate were made, we have agreed to an extensive range of additional relaxations. And that list includes a range of activities such as outdoor weddings, caring for animals, outdoor sports, the reopening of retail shops and other outlets, as well as activities associated with those in relation to moving house. We have also taken steps to allow the hospitality sector to prepare for the reopening of a range of hotel and other accommodation facilities. And the executive has commenced an incremental and a rolling process of easing restrictions advised by scientific advice, and crucially, on the basis of managing and minimising risk. Ta Egiri, Leshan Korhege Shaw. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the regulations have worked and continue to work. They have saved lives and they have prevented our health system from becoming overwhelmed. I have previously said here, as we continue our pathway to recovery from coronavirus, that it is right that we recognise the positive role played by all of our citizens. By following the advice and guidance, the actions of the executive and behaviour of citizens have helped to reduce the infection rate and to save countless lives. However, we should also recognise always that for many people this has been an extremely difficult time. Many hundreds of our fellow citizens, our friends and family members have died across this region and throughout this island. Thousands of people, as a direct result, have suffered the pain of the loss of a loved one. And our thoughts and sympathies are with all of those who have lost family and friends today. Mr Deputy Speaker, we all want to see a return to the normal ways of living. But that will only be possible for as long as we are winning the battle against COVID-19. But we cannot afford to be complacent. COVID-19 is still very much within our midst. It is an invisible and a never present threat to our health and well-being. We will have to learn how to live with this virus for some considerable time to come. And unfortunately, that means that we will also need to keep managing the way we go about our daily business and how we live our lives. In conclusion, Deputy Speaker, I would say to members that there will be further similar debates in the weeks and the months ahead. The scientific and the expert medical advice, we hope, will allow for more amendment regulations to be made. I can assure members 
that further relaxations across key areas will come into effect on that continuing and rolling basis. But we cannot afford to adopt a reckless approach. The pathway out of lockdown and towards recovery is not going to be straightforward. Yes, there are sometimes contradictions, and there have been criticisms of the approach taken. Some feel that we are not moving quickly enough. Others have and will argue that we should do things differently. But I believe that ministerial colleagues in our five-party power-sharing government are doing their best to provide steady and cohesive leadership. This Assembly also needs to continue to speak with a single united voice. At the same time, we must all continue to do our part as politicians, lawmakers and leaders in the community to remind our citizens of the need to stay safe as they venture out more and more. Tamwich Gafoil and St Varna Whale, Kaifer and Foda Hyatu. We must lead by example. So keep your distance, limit your contact with other people, and wash your hands well and often. Fanagi or Hulu Makela, Niagi or Lawa. Mullaman Run, Agus Narelaha, Don I commend the regulations to the Assembly. For a I now call on the chairperson of the committee for the executive office, Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I speak on behalf of the committee. Uh, the committee welcomes the lifting of the restrictions when the time is right. However, it would be remiss of us not to acknowledge once again um, that they have had and are still having a considerable impact on our normal lives, and for some people this is proving very difficult to live with. It is well documented that activities such as going to the cinema and attending live entertainment events are good for our health and well-being. Throughout the course of this pandemic, we have heard about the negative impact lockdown is having on the mental well-being of all sections of the community, so taking steps to try and alleviate that is very much welcome. Such events are also key to creating a sense of togetherness, and that is particularly relevant in these times where a lot of the focus is on telling people to stay physically apart. I recognise that events can't happen indoors yet, but permitting outdoor drive-in events allows people to be entertained in safety while reaping the benefits to their well-being. And as I've mentioned in previous debates, the reasons why restrictions can be lifted is largely down to the impact that social distancing is having on the transmission rate of the virus. Social distancing is no less important at this point in time than it was a couple of months ago. And I would urge the public to keep up the good work and continue to show the discipline and remain compliant to the social distancing guidelines. Mr Deputy Speaker, just to speak in my own capacity as an MLA, I want to welcome to the relaxations contained in the amendment number four, as I know that they will provide a form of entertainment which will help people as we have limited social outlets at the current time. I also acknowledge the futility of this debate today, given that I think that we are up to Amendment No. 8 at this stage, uh, which has been uh, made and introduced, but we are only at No. 4 here in our discussions in the Assembly. So the time lag does make these debates seem somewhat defunct. Um, and I will use the opportunity, though, to raise, as ever, my concern uh, about recent announcements and, again, the lack of clarity that there can be regarding some of the more recent ones. I mean, for example, many businesses were very concerned last week because they did not know if they were or were not covered by the, re, uh, the relaxations in terms of whether their door did or did not go out into the public place. This was on the back of the hotels that were approved, yet at that stage there was nothing about the food and beverage outlets. And of course, beauticians and hairdressers are all having to wait, but yet we can get the dog groomed. So every decision does tend to raise more questions uh, and also some concerns. And I, I welcome that for the hospitality sector, there is now a date, uh, and we do accept that that is an indicative date. And I welcome that timings are now included. And as I say and reiterate, they are indicative times. People know that they can change, but at least at that time is there. I have called for timings in every single statement that I have made on this issue in the House. And indeed, it is something for which the SDLP was publicly criticised 
by other parties for asking for. But I welcome that the Executive now understands and accepts the need for timescales. Industry, business, commerce need these timescales to prepare. Coronavirus has wreaked havoc on their work already, and they don't need the further uncertainty of a lack of timescale to add to their pain. Timings are welcome, and if they need to slip by a short period of time, the sector will understand that, but they will be happy that they have the target dates. I also want to highlight that I continue to be unhappy that many of the announcements are being made in either TV studios, on the airwaves, or in newspaper columns, and this is becoming a little bit tedious. Ministers should have the decency to wait until a decision is taken by the executive before briefing on it, and then come and update this House on it, because that would feel more procedurally appropriate. Many of the announcements could be bounced by public feelings and sentiments which are stoked by the leaks and briefings, and that is not helpful. We all should agree that the scientific evidence, and I continue to call for that scientific evidence to be published, should be the guide and not just the last lobby group that we have met. As I say, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, we are in an unusual position of agreeing to a decision that has already been taken and implemented, and therefore I welcome this announcement as I did when it was announced about three weeks ago. Thank you. And I call the Chair of the Health Committee, Colin Gildenew. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Health Committee was briefed on this statutory rule by the Chief Environmental Officer on the 28th of May and agreed it was content with the regulations. The statutory rule allows for the staging of drive-in cinema screenings and live music or theatre performances. The committee considered this statutory rule alongside a number of other regulations providing for easement to restrictions. As I have previously informed members, the committee raised several issues with the departmental official during its consideration. These included the evidence and tracking in the decision-making process behind the various easements and the strategies for engagement with harder to reach communities. Adiv Servishi Chomain Eastjach Agus Liriha Juru Lishan Kushta Mavina Haishna Agus Spas An Lahakaj A Oystyle Golig Fair Dutarlu. In relation to drive in services and performances, the committee were informed that if organisers had the facilities to accommodate such an event, then it would be permitted. With regard to the staging of drive in live music in particular, members expressed the concern that those attending might be tempted to exit their vehicles to join in. In response, the Chief Environmental Officer advised the committee that it is up to the organiser to ensure that people stay in their cars during the event and that they are from the same household, although he accepted that there are practical issues with how an organiser might actually do this. However, the committee were advised that anyone planning to stage a drive-in event is legally obliged to ensure compliance with the regulations and must detail how they plan to do so. In closing, as Health Committee Chair, I would say that while the committee supports this particular easement, the concern was expressed that some may view the relaxation of restrictions as the end of the pandemic. And I acknowledge the remarks from the previous two speakers in relation to that. Uh, and the committee recognises that ongoing danger of the current situation and the risk of complacency. And we urge people to keep to the rules and to continue to maintain social distancing. Boyhlam Kapla Fakal Ella Ara Nishmar Urlari Slancha Sinn Fein. I'd like to say a few words now as Sinn Fein health spokesperson. Karam Falcha Rivna Shrenta COVID 19. Awelu Marcia Hirlacher and Kushta Slancha Agus Urlari Slancha Sinn Fein Yoga. Kaifer Nishrenta Ave Ikchakt Lilas and Fubal Agus Akhorlia Oliakta. As chair of both the Health Committee and Sinn Fein spokesperson for health, I do welcome the incremental easing of the restrictions. However, as previously mentioned, these must only be done in accordance with health and scientific guidance. A safe and gradual exit from the lockdown is possible, but we all have responsibility in making that happen. Our citizens have, to date, played a significant role in curtailing the COVID-19 virus. Since March, we as a society have done well in observing the rules on hand hygiene, safe distancing and other public health measures taken to stop the spread of the virus. I too recognise that that has had a, a 
toll in terms of mental health and in terms of, of people going about their normal life. If we are to ease COVID restrictions, the importance of continuing with these measures must be communicated through public health messaging and become common practice in our everyday lives for the foreseeable future. We must be assured that the Department of Health and all relevant public bodies have put in place extensive and sustainable programmes of isolating, testing and contact tracing so that we can suppress the COVID-19 virus to the maximum degree possible. Advice from institutions such as the World Health Organization and the European Centre for Disease Control is that as we relax COVID restrictions, we must ensure the infrastructure is in place to detect and react quickly to any outbreak or surges that we might see in the future. Evidence from countries such as New Zealand, Germany and South Korea is that extensive case detection, testing, contact tracing and isolating has allowed these places to restart their economies safely and effectively. Ni Higlin Talu Slani Yanu Dendul Kun Kin Agusmoi Argriu Guji Show Gudiglin Kudj Dunashrenta Awelu. We are not out of the woods yet, but thankfully, through our actions to date, we have reached a point where some easement of restrictions is possible. As we cautiously emerge from lockdown, we must all understand that we are all responsible for the safety of our families, friends and neighbours. I call Pam Cameron. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I think I speak on behalf of many of my constituents in uh, expressing relief that we are now progressing with the lifting of restrictions at pace. While mindful of the need to protect public health and that we have rightly been taking one small step at a time, it is essential that we return to some degree of normality as soon as possible. Led by science, yes, but also led by the need to protect jobs, to reboot our public services, including our health service and get Northern Ireland moving again. Recently, it was reported that 95% of the population here had not had COVID-19, and as such, it was suggested that we should be slowing down the process of lifting restrictions. I believe this executive has acted well in protecting public health. We have seen the success that these regulations, and more so public adherence to rules and guidance, have been in, in the much lower figure of the COVID-19 deaths than the reasonable worst case scenario. I also believe that we need to proceed with easing of restrictions so as many more lives are not lost through non-COVID conditions. I desperately want to see measures put in place to allow those to safely have contact and visitation from loved ones um, in care settings. And we know the impact that loneliness and isolation has on our mental health. What we need to focus on now is a twin, tra twin track approach continue to protect the most vulnerable whilst restoring confidence with the wider public to get out, support the local business and rebuild community and to do that safely. The reality of course is that the extreme pressures on our health service from coronavirus have been alleviated. The public are to be praised for that and not punished for longer than is necessary. I would very much encourage the health minister and indeed the entire executive to now really push ahead with the reopening of all our health service at large with that vital reform that is necessary. A week's delay at this stage is exacerbating problems down the line for patients and for the system. We must also see specific areas within our health and social care system get back on track. I think particularly in, in uh, light of respite provision for those who regard this as a lifeline, who are physically and mentally exhausted and who desperately need the service restored. We need to now step up and support for all of these families. Mr Deputy Speaker, I think it would be remiss of me not to mention once again our healthcare workers and the tremendous work they have done, and not least our ambulance service. It disgusts me that this frontline service, lifesavers, have suffered 35 attacks in the space of a week, and I know this is to be condemned, and condemned utterly by everyone in this House. Mr Deputy Speaker, I look forward to Thursday and further announcements and dates of restrictions being lifted and some form of normality returning and I commend the executive for the work they're doing to this end. And just in finishing, Mr Deputy Speaker, I wanted to uh, just give another reminder out for people to keep their distance, to continually wash their hands, and also uh, a reminder that if you have any of the coronavirus symptoms, you should be seeking a test if you're over the age of five years old, because it's vitally important that we are tracking and tracing this virus to allow us to return to some form of normality or a new normal. I think that is vital at this time. So thank you. I call Pat Sheehan. Gormaugh, the free last, Gormaugh, 
And uh, I'll preface my remarks by saying, first of all, that uh, anything I say here today is related to the uh, regulations as they're being amended here today, uh, and I want that to be clear. Secondly, and I've said this at every debate of this sort for the past uh, four times, I think, now we've spoken, that uh, under normal circumstances, there's no way I would be supporting these regulations, but we are still in a crisis and an emergency, and it's important uh, that we are aware of that and we continue to ensure that uh, the proper message goes out to our citizens. Uh, th these amendments to the regulations allow outdoor drive-in cinemas, concerts uh, and theatre productions. And as has already been mentioned, they came into effect on the 21st of March. And uh, since then, there has been the easing of uh, a large number of other restrictions. And of course, that's to be welcomed. Uh, everybody uh, is glad to see, I'm sure, the opening up of society, people able to meet family members again, again and socialise to a certain extent. And that's a good thing. Uh, but the battle against uh, COVID-19 hasn't been won, uh, not by a long shot. Uh, and there are a number of things that we need to focus on as there are more and more uh, easements of the restrictions. And first of all, probably, we need to get our heads around uh, the island of Ireland uh, as one single entity in terms of the fight against this virus. Because it has been said on many occasions in this chamber that the virus doesn't respect the border. It's not even that it doesn't respect it. It doesn't know there's a border there. Uh, and there has been a high incidence of uh, COVID-19 in around the border areas, and that's all the more reason why we need to deal with this uh, on a single entity basis, uh, on an all-island basis. And there has been talk also about uh, a phone app, and we've discussed this with the minister and the CMO in the committee, and any phone app that's going to be used in terms of the testing and tracing, it must work on both sides of the border. If it doesn't work on both sides of the border, it's not going to cut the mustard. It's as simple as that. And I mean, what's more important than anything, a number of speakers have already mentioned this, is that there is a proper system of testing, tracing, isolating, and supporting uh, uh, as these restrictions begin to ease. Some of the countries that have been mentioned didn't have a lockdown as severe as our own here. And indeed, ours wasn't even the most severe. In places like South Korea, the, uh, the economy, by and large, carried on. Bars and restaurants were still opened. But because they had such an effective and widespread system of testing and tracing and isolating the virus, society was, by and large, able to carry on as normal. Now, of course, it has been said that they had previous experience with SARS, with MERS, uh, with uh, swine flu and avian flu, uh, and so on. Uh, but we need to learn from the best practice, and the best practice is in areas like this. Now, the difficulty now we face with easing these restrictions is that there may be an upsurge uh, in the virus. I, I just hear this morning that there are two new cases uh, uh, diagnosed in New Zealand for the first time something like 24 days, although it has been established that in both cases they travelled from the UK. Uh, but China has also experienced an upsurge, as has Japan uh, and somewhere else in, in the Far East, I just can't remember now. But what's important is that uh, none of these outbreaks has led to mass lockdown uh, of whole countries. What they have been able to do, because they have that effective system of tracking and tracing, is that they can isolate the virus if it's in a particular area or in a particular market or a block of flats or wherever. If the system of testing, tracing and isolating is effective, then there can be localised lockdowns rather than all of society uh, having to be shut down. So. Uh, I suppose, uh, in conjunction with that, we need uh, a clear messaging from the executive here. Uh, I get the feeling now that with the easing of these restrictions, many people feel 
they can just go about life as normal as they did uh, before this pandemic started. And of course, that's not the case. Uh, we need to listen to the medical and the scientific evidence if more restrictions are going to be eased. Uh, so the messaging from the executive has to be crystal clear. And also, as we, as, as we move forward, and it may not be directly uh, connected to these uh, uh, regulations, the care sector has to be protected in a way that it wasn't at the outset of this emergency. Uh, many people believe that the care sector was effectively thrown to the wolves. So we need to make sure the care sector is protected. And there does need to be a serious discussion about, about the, the wearing of face masks and whether there's a need for regulations and around that. Uh, I call Mike Nesbitt. Uh, Deputy Speaker, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I know the primary purpose of, of this debate is to endorse decisions already taken uh, by the executive, but like Pat Sheehan, I would like to take the opportunity perhaps to look a little bit more broadly at the issues uh, that we face. And I'm sure like all members, uh, we long for the day when we return to what we might call the normal politics in a full house or whatever a full house is going to be under the new norm. And if it was normal and we didn't have this crisis, I'm sure we would have debated the programme for government uh, by now and hopefully agreed it. It has sat in draft form for far too long, not for months, but for years. Uh, and I remind members that the purpose is to improve the well-being of all by tackling disadvantage. That below that, uh, one of the 14 high-end outcomes is to give our young people the best start in life. And in terms of indicators of success, number two is to reduce health inequality. Number three is to increase healthy life expectancy. And number 11 is to improve educational outcomes. 12, to reduce educational uh, inequalities. And 15, to improve child development. And below that again, one of the measures of success in this outcome-based accountability program is to tackle the gap between the percentage of school leavers and the percentage of school leavers receiving free school meals at level two or above, including English and maths, and that's A star to C, GCSEs. Would the member give away? Yes. Giving way, and, and I, I hear what he says, and I agree with him with regards to the functioning of government and the programme for government, uh, doing the best it can for all of our people. But I also agree. Uh, uh, would well, the member agree with me that we, don't, we haven't even had a chance to align the budget with the programme for government to make sure that we populate these outputs with financial clout in order to get to a, a place and move to a direction, move in a direction that will benefit all the people in the programme for government? Can, can I remind members that, that this debate is about COVID-19 restrictions? I will allow some latitude, but I don't want there to be a debate on the programme for government. Mr Nesbitt. Deputy Speaker, I, I stand admonished, but I, I hope you'll give me a little leeway, and I thank the member for his intervention. And I do agree that aligning the programme for government and the budget and making the budget multi-year is all critical. The point I'm trying to get to is that we need to tackle, in this crisis, holiday hunger. Now, it is partly COVID-19 and it's partly not. It is COVID-19 because more young people and more families are finding themselves in financial difficulty because of the public health crisis. But beyond that, it is an enduring problem that we face. And yes. I thank the member for giving way, and I think he has raised a very important topic under the, the COVID-19 restrictions and the further impact of poverty on families that weren't experienced in poverty before. But the member will remember, I think will be reminded of a, of a a long gallery event last year, I think it was hosted by uh, children in Northern Ireland, when we talked about uh, food poverty and, and children's food poverty. And there was an example all in Portadown of a charity where a mum was sending in a lunchbox which was empty, but for a note asking the charity to feed that child. Would the member agree with me that it is lamentable that we're still talking about that in 2020 and it takes something like COVID for us to seriously address it here in this assembly? I thank the member for his intervention, and, and it was a memorable moment, not in a good way, that uh, will not be forgotten. So, Deputy Speaker, I'll not test your patience much further. All I want to say is that uh, there is no logic in us saying that we give free school meals during term time 
but do not give free school meals during holiday time. If a child needs a state intervention in May and June, they must need that state intervention in July uh, and August. And the First Minister hinted very broadly during question time a couple of hours ago uh, that the Executive is moving on this, but she did put in the proviso that it was dependent on finance. Uh, the Prime Minister has announced, I think, £120 million or so of intervention for, for free meals for children in England over the summer. If there's a Barnet consequential, that's north of £3 million. That should be plenty. I simply believe that in terms of tackling holiday hunger, this House has a moral obligation, and I invite members to join me in pressing the Executive to fulfil that obligation. I call Paula Bradshaw. Um, thank you, Deputy Speaker. I rise to support the regulations as amended. I would first like to send my best wishes and speedy recovery to my fellow constituency MLAs, Deirdre Hardy and Christopher Stalford. A timely reminder to us all how important it is to look after our health and take time out when needed to seek treatment and recuperate. The change to, to be covered this afternoon relates to drive-in cinemas, and I have no issue with this change. In South Belfast, we have already seen some preparation and innovation around this, with particular reference to the Go Hydro complex on the same field road, which will be showing films from the 19th of June. A very welcome boost for local family provision and economic activity after the months of lockdown, and I'm sure it will be a great success. On Sunday, while out walking in the grounds of Ulster University in Jordanstown, I came upon a drive-in church. Uh, we in this chamber debated this amendment to the regulations recently, and I was pleased to note that the car park was full. There were plenty of stewards about, and it seemed to be very well organised. Another way in which society has embraced our current circumstances and found ways to bring people together in common cause. However, after all this positivity, Mr Deputy Speaker, I do want to put on record some enduring concerns. The first issue I'd like to touch upon is shielding. On Friday, it will be 12 weeks from the time of issuing of the first letter to patients from their GPs. And I've heard that some constituents have received an updated letter either from their GP or from the Department of Health up until the 30th of June, while others are still waiting. This um, is causing that latter group some concern, especially as we start to see places of employment opening up and they fear that they may be excluded in the revision process and therefore forced to return to work. Therefore, it is so important, firstly, that the remaining letters are posted out, that guidance and communication um, continues to flow, and lastly, that full consideration is given to those people who are shielding in terms of the changes that they should expect in terms of accessing care and treatment by the Department of Health, its new management board and the five trusts as they take forward the stages of rebuilding of the health and social care services. There are certainly opportunities here and we also need to ensure that those affected by the re-establishment process of our health service are included in these conversations as much as possible. I would also place on record my deep concern that people living with diabetes have been excluded from receiving these shielding letters despite the fact that the Department of Health advised that they were re revising the list and guidance. And so it is perplexing to me that they have appeared to ignore this huge body of evidence that has shown that 10% of people with diabetes who are admitted to hospital with the virus die, die within seven days. These people are clearly clinically vulnerable. The next point I would touch upon is the economy, with particular reference to private practitioners providing health care many of whom have contacted us in this chamber concerned about their future viability and asking questions about how they are going to provide treatment for their vulnerable patients. I am talking about our dentists, our opticians, our podiatrists, our physiotherapists and many other front-facing allied health professionals who are urgently awaiting guidance and who want to open their businesses in a safe manner as soon as possible. Another aspect of the economy that urgently needs attention relates to the provision of childcare, and my colleague Chris Little will be touching upon this. Um, also in relation to the issue of the economy, we need to be careful as the executive moves through the steps of the recovery process that there is cons consistency in rationale and measure. Further to this, we must recognise, therefore, that it will be harder to enforce the regulations and that people will undoubtedly, as we have already seen, interpret the changes in different ways. Associated with this, I would like to express my concern at the absence of reliable data on which to base our decisions on easing lockdown. The data document that was released on Sunday night was bizarre. 
It has major gaps in information. What information it did provide was vague, and the conclusions it drew from the information were, were outright dubious based on the latest scientific and global research into the virus. We have to understand that this is a matter of considerable urgency because as we move through this crisis, we need to involve the opening up, but we also need to be managing the risk, not just for the authorities, but more importantly for each and every one of us as active citizens. In conclusion, I would appeal to ministers and the authorities to shift priorities, to ensure issues around childcare and those shielding are resolved, and to ensure that communication and key messages and most up-to-date information to the entire population is clear. To the Health Minister specifically, he needs to improve the data, the research and his conclusions on which he is making future decisions. And for us all to continue to show that respect, kindness and patience we all need. Thank you. I call Paul Free. Deputy Speaker, uh, I suppose I would like to first of all uh, address the issue that was raised, I think we call him uh, the chair of the uh, committee, uh, regarding the time lag that this House debates these regulations and the lifting of such. And whilst I not be too hard on the Assembly and the cogs that turn very slowly, I think this goes to prove once again that draconian legislation like this just does not fit. And it doesn't fit the, the Assembly system. Uh, or the accountability and the democratically, democratic apparatus for which we hold these things to account. So it is a bit of a farce, really, that we're debating the lifting of regulations that were previous regulations being lifted. It, it, it is bizarre. It is, it is a bit of a farce. And whilst these amendments are welcome, they seem to raise further questions every time that the executive struggles to deal with and answer. And that then has a ramification for publication and announcements and for media messaging and everything else. And if we do not get the message right, then we will be putting people's lives at risk. Because what I've found, and again, I've always been nervous around these regulations, these this draconian law that, that goes into people's homes, that actually marks out every twist and turn of their life and tries to legislate for it. I, I, I think that it just, whilst it saved lives, it just hasn't really worked. And worse than that, it maybe has had a detrimental effect on people's lives in many ways, which we won't really see until it surfaces many months and weeks from now. Uh, some examples of that, Mr Deputy Speaker, is the, the, the lifting of the restrictions for retail, for the shops. When that announcement was made, there was massive confusion in some sectors as to whether they could open or not. And we had some retail publishing statements on a Friday night and having to retract that they were opening on the Monday, the very next day, the Saturday and the Sunday. Some businesses went on ahead and opened anyway, even though it was, it was against, even though it was against the regulations, they opened anyway. And when I spoke to the council officials, and when businesses spoke to the council officials, it was very, very clear, council were not going to enforce them. Now, that poses the question, what good are law, what good is law or regulations if they're not going to be enforced? Uh, so you had some businesses opening that shouldn't have been opening. Uh, some businesses putting out statements that they were going to open and then retracting that the next day and keeping closed, but looking down the street and seeing a similar business opened. And you had confusion for a long time. Now, I'm glad that's clarified and the retail can open. But that has had a massive impact for people and businesses. P businesses that have struggled because they haven't been opened for all these months and and some haven't been able to avail of the supports, although many have, and it's been very, very welcome. But what I, I think what annoys folk more than anything is the fact that it seems to be the very brick of society, the very unit of society, the family, has been left behind. Now, I don't know why, but when you look through the step 
change plan that was released by the executive. It stated on step one that you could visit family members indoors. Now, I would ask the question, why was that in step one? What science, now we've always been told, the science dictates, medical advice and science dictates. Why then was this step, this aspect of step one, in step one? If we are now not even completed step one, but we're mostly through step two. And it feels and it seems as if family has been left behind. The amount of good work that has been going through with businesses and the executive listening to businesses is very, very good. And they've been able to open things up and get things cranked up again. And people are very thankful. Businesses are very thankful. But is it not a bit of a farce that you can visit a family member in a garden centre, in a shopping centre, soon to be a pub, but you can't visit them in their own homes. You can go to their back garden, but you can't enter their premises to use the toilet. Yep, yep. I welcome the point that the, the member is making, and you know, it sometimes is underpinned by the scientific evidence. And again, just how it, people, if they understood the scientific evidence, might be able to accept it. And if that scientific evidence is being published, it's not been very clear and made widely available. And would you agree with me that actually making that scientific evidence more widely available would help people to understand why these differences are happening? Because, like himself, I don't understand why these decisions are being taken. I, I agree with 100%. I think the more information that we can get into the public, the better it will be for the public. It will help inform them. It would help them see the rationale behind decisions that are being made. And, and it would also help people to align with the regulations. Because I fear, especially over the last week and a half, two weeks, there are so many of our population who basically have flaunted the law, flaunted the rules, and have basically says, we're not going to follow these regulations anymore. Uh, but, but the issue about the family unit is fundamental. When there are so many vulnerable people out there in family settings, not knowing what to do what's best, whether they can visit the family members who they miss the most, and, and can't have their children round and their grandchildren round to their home. And, you know, a family member is not going to put another family member at risk. So they'll take extra precautions if that was to happen that they were able to get visits uh, from family members. And I think it's a massive issue. And I think placing that aspect in step one has been a fundamental wrong if it has not meant to have been there in the first place. So my question is this. When you were working out the step plan, where was the science and the medical advice that told you to put that family visitation issue into step one? And if it was medical and science, then why has it not been lifted when it was step one? Because now we're through step two. We're now eating in at step three. And I'm sure in some aspects we're in step four. I'm not sure. I th to be honest with you, I'm getting confused myself. But why is it then that family members have to go to a retail outlet, a clothing shop, to meet their grandchildren? It's a bit of a farce, really, is it not? Uh, and I would like that to be explained to me. And, and as much information about this aspect released as soon as possible, so people can still see, at least they can see when they're in their homes, not being able to visit their loved ones, the rationale behind it and the justification for it. And if, it's, if, if we got it wrong with regards to being in step one, if family visitation in their own home should have been step three, it should have been step three or step four, then so be it. Say that. Say that we got that aspect wrong. But if we've always been going by science, then how did we get it wrong? Can I also raise an issue about the, the restrictions that we're talking about today, about allowing drive-in aspects of social activity. There's no, just as, just as we can't, just as the police have refused to enforce some of these regulations at this point, the police, the police and I told the Justice Committee weeks ago that they were not going to enforce 
I think it was section four, the travel, the travel aspect. They, they told us they were simply not going to do it anymore. Uh, but how do you expect then a, uh, an events promoter or an organizer of an event to police the amount of people in a vehicle and making sure that each person in that vehicle is from the same household? Now, again, I've, I've, I've witnessed over the last number of weeks the, the amount of young people in cars, cruising, I think is the term they use. I'm not young enough to know. And I, I worry about that aspect. But it seems to be the case that especially the young people who are out and about in that way, not everybody, and I'm not going to be general about the issue because many will be adhering to these regulations for fear, for fear of their own health and their life. But it seems to be in so many, so many of our population, they're now at the point where these regulations don't count. And that's worrying. Because I know the best intentions of the assembly, and sorry, the executive, was to protect life and to make sure we didn't burden the NHS. So I get the rationale for the regulations. But, but I, I think we just need to be realistic about draconian legislation, legislating for every twist and turn of people's lives, and being honest and saying, has it, really, has it, has it worked to the effect that we thought it would? And as we have been loosening up these restrictions, I think with, with that, that, that's, an easier answer, that's an easier question to answer. Because I think now what has happened in many people's minds is they've just flipped over. And they're just go, trying to go back to normal. And the way they would have spent last summer is now consistent to their thought process now. And that's a worry for me. And I think it's around messaging. Because what I think is this. People are equating the lifting of restrictions to the lessening of risk. And that's a massive issue. That's a massive issue. So for the last 12 weeks, everybody, most people have been cocooned in their homes and they've been washing their hands like blazes. I've never washed my hands so much. And there was an argument to say, well, it was always good to be hygienic and always good to have personal hygiene habits. But there's an argument to say, well, if you're cocooned and you're not meeting anybody and you're, not, you're in your own bubble, well, washing hands is very good, but not necessarily essential. Now what we need to say is, now that you're getting lifted out of these restrictions, now that you're interfacing with more people, now that you're touching more surfaces, now that you're into more shops, now you're getting into new, more buildings, you really need to wash your hands quadruple compared to the last 12 weeks. You really need to realize that because the restrictions have gone, it's not that the risk has gone. And I think people are equating that. People are saying, oh, it's okay now to go shopping. So it's okay now, there's no health risk. But really, there's a greater health risk because the exposure is greater. And I think that's a message that needs to get out. And I don't know whether it's getting out or whether it's failed. But it needs to be reinforced time and time again. And I must say, even over the weekend, when I seen people out and about, it looked as if nothing. It looked like as if it was June 2019 rather than June 2020. And I really worry about people's health. Because you know something? If we do have any sort of second wave, Imagine going to businesses and saying, okay, folks, we're going to have to go down to another shutdown. That will end it for most. Most of the people will say, if I close again, I'm not reopening. And some people will say, Sojis, you told us that the last time, and the numbers weren't as first feared. So, you know, is this one big conspiracy theory. Now, I know I'm being flippant with language here, but it's to prove a point. Because I'm thinking this. The public's thinking this. And I'm only relaying what the public, some of the public are thinking. And that number is getting greater by the day. So I think the executive really has to focus down, double down on the messaging around lifting of restrictions, restrictions, but greater the risk. And at the minute, I don't think that balance is there. I think it's the other way about. People are thinking that lifting of restrictions means uh, lessening of risk. And that's a really fundamental error for all of us to make and take. Uh, 
the issue about the, my colleague Pam Cameron raised about the ambulance workers, I think that is horrific. I think it's horrific in normal times, but I think it's even more horrific in a, in a height of crisis. And uh, I brought in the legislation a number of years ago that brought in tougher sentencing for ambulance workers, brought it into line with police officers and fire, and fire service. And I believe that was greatly needed. And I had a private member's bill here before the Assembly fell, bringing into line accident emergency staff also to bring their tougher sentencing up. And I think that's something that the executive and, and the minister should look at. And I, I know that I can recall him giving that commitment that he would look at that. So that's something that's vitally important. And a way that we can actually, actually help and protect staff. Uh, there was always a question around that private member's bill, whether it was too restrictive around accident emergency staff only. But that's something I hope that the health minister will look at. And you know, we clap, we, we've clapped our NHS staff for so many weeks now, and rightly so. But if we can give them a, a, a greater degree of protection with regards to tougher sentencing for assault, then I think that's some way that we can go to reward and, and guarantee their safety in the future. Now, it won't stop attacks. Can I draw the member even, back to the restrictions? Yeah, yeah, I, I will, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. But again, the, the, the ambulance workers and staff who have been at the forefront of this battle, who have went into people's homes where there could have well been COVID-19. And for them to be attacked in this way is, is, is really, really harsh. Yes, I will. Yep. Can I just say that I have found the member's contribution confusing. Um, you started out by uh, seemingly um, criticising some of the uh, elements of these regulations that have impacted on civil liberties and people's, and people's movement, and then you proceeded then to talk about the need for caution. I, I just find it extremely difficult, but would the member agree with me that it's not only the executive that needs to communicate clearly, but that this House needs to set an example and to communicate clearly to people out there and not to create confusion by dissecting individual elements of these regulations? Y yes. Uh, uh, let me be clear. These regulations, I believe, had to come in. I believe they had to come in to save lives. But the very day and hour they, they came in, the question I posed was, how are we getting out of them? And I think that has proved difficult. And I think I was proved right. Uh, and if it leads to confusion with regards to lifting, and the point I make, the aspect I make about family visitations being in step one with regards to the recovery plan, how did that ever come about? And how is it the case that we're not completely finished on step one? When we're already going through, we've nearly completed, I think, step two, but we haven't. We're eating away at step three, and I think we're now even into step four. Well, yep. Thank the member for give way. Um, to, to add to the previous question, uh, my recollection that the executive um, of which his party is a leading part made it fairly clear that passage through the steps would not be an entire step, and then an, uh, followed by another entire step. So he should know well that that's the approach that um, the executive have laid out. And I, I do agree, we need to take care in this assembly not to, yes, by all means, relay concerns, but not to add to them or, or to confuse further and to try and provide clarity um, that is coming forward in the regulations today. Yeah, yeah and again, I, I, so the step change plan it was announced that wouldn't, each aspect of that wouldn't go at the same speed. And I get that. That's quite simple. But each box was to go at the same time. So that was one part of... Family visitation was one part of a box that has been left behind. Now, I simply pose the question, was the science... Was that geared up for the science? Was that advised... Was that family visitation right placed in step one because of science and medical advice? And if it was, is that science and medical advice now changed? Uh, on this issue of concern to the community. But we are starting to repeat the discussion on this. This debate is specifically about the removal or, of some of the regulations. So I would wish uh, to draw back to those changes in the regulation. Mr. Frey. Okay, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I, I, I respect your ruling on this. I, I'm nearly finished, Mr. Deputy Speaker, but what, could I, what I would like to add also to this is the restrictions around childcare. 
provision. I think that the childcare sector is in a very difficult position, and I welcome the announcements by the First Minister on this issue. And I think that that has come as some relief to the childcare workers out there. Uh, but it was, a, it was a first that the key workers element of the childcare was not in line with the key workers aspect of, of who should go to work and who shouldn't. And that, 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 has, been a, that has been a problem the, way, the whole way through that, where you, a key worker was electrical workers and gas workers, but they, yet they could not get their family supported through childcare, their young ones supported through childcare. It just seemed to be a nonsense. And that's still something that needs to be uh, resolved completely. And the fact that the childcare sector is, is struggling with very little support and needs to get opened up also in a safe manner. Because whilst we send more people back to work when these restrictions are being lifted, these restrictions included today, well then surely, surely we need to be looking at the childcare element to ensure that those people are supported, that those people can support the families who are going back to work and child mind the children of those workers. And that's something I think that we need to grasp and, and resolve. Uh, Mr. Speaker, so I, I, I support the lifting of these restrictions. I, I think it's welcome. But I think the messaging out there has to be clearer and the science must be published in order that people can see the logic of these decisions. And I would ask the, the ministers replying about the family visitation in step one aspect. Thank you. I call Alan Chambers. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, I support these amendments as they, they signal uh, more baby steps uh, back to normality. And they will be welcomed by uh, many of the public at large. Uh, I drove past the drive in cinema on Saturday afternoon uh, down at the Titanic Quarter. Um, it was a bright, sunny afternoon, and the arena was absolutely packed. Uh, I was surprised to see a film actually on the screen, as we usually associate cinema as being a place with the lights out. I think that the huge attendance uh, demonstrates the public thirst to get back to being able to enjoy being entertained as a family. And I understand that a uh, concert performance is planned at the same arena uh, in early July, and I'm sure people will be looking forward to that. The junior minister, in his opening remarks, uh, said that the, uh, the executive weren't being influenced or led by what was being done in other jurisdictions, and, and I concur with that. I think that that is the right thing to do, that we should be dealing with this uh, on a local basis based on the local scientific and medical advice that we have, the executive have been getting. He also referenced um, contradictions, and, um, but I think it's important to acknowledge that the, uh, the executive are acting solely in the interests of protecting and saving life uh, in Northern Ireland. And against that, they also have to balance the demands of our economy, because we can't allow that to sink either. So uh, it is a bit of a balancing act, and I think we need to acknowledge that. In terms of um, the contradictions, um, Mr. Fru uh, referenced uh, about uh, travel, that the police had indicated to the Justice uh, Committee that they wouldn't really be enforcing it. And I noted that the junior minister, in his opening remarks, in, in referencing the, these amendments, said that they provide a reasonable excuse for anybody who was stopped driving their car. It would be a reasonable excuse to say that they were driving to a drive-in cinema or drive-in concert. But there's a huge contradiction there insofar as equally someone could drive from Newry to Londonderry and be stopped in the course of their journey. And if they say that they're going to drive into a garden centre, uh, that equally is a reasonable excuse with no uh, distance limit uh, placed on it. So that's the sort of contradiction that uh, perhaps causes the police maybe some embarrassment. But I'm not going to criticise uh, anyone for those contradictions. I think that 
This it is, we have to acknowledge, it's an emer emergency regulations. Uh, it's difficult uh, when you're rushing things through and you're, you're taking shortcuts, which is, are an absolutely inevitable if you're bringing in emergency legislation, that you can lose sight of unintended consequences. So I think that, that really is what has led to the contradictions. But I think we all have to maybe stop sniping at those and uh, uh, just acknowledge that uh, this has all been done in the best interests uh, of, of the public. In terms of, of going forward, um, the things that uh, people have been uh, sending me emails and making phone calls to me, and I'm sure to others, uh, the, the rest of the people in the House, have been about uh, hairdressers and barbers, and I'm, I'm a living example. I can't wait uh, for the barber to reopen. Um, and dentists, as, as well, are, are, are appealing to us. But again, I think we've got to acknowledge that these are um, uh, services that uh, involve close contact, and they are in enclosed spaces. So it does make it more difficult, and I think that people maybe are going to have to be a little bit more uh, patient uh, for those uh, before those two services will become. Uh, yes. Further to the point that he's making as well, do you not think though that we should be asking the executive to look at other experiences? So, for example, in Spain, barbers have been open for the last four weeks. You know, if they can open safely in other places, and I'm sure the hairdressers are open there as well. And we have a sector here that's dying to get open again so that they can do the work and people that really want it. And there's other countries where they're able to do it. Again, it brings us back to what, why is the scientific evidence here saying that it can't happen, but yet in other parts of Europe it can? Well, I accept the member's right to have that opinion. But as I said earlier in my, in my, uh, my speech here, uh, I uh, welcome the fact that the executive are not looking over their shoulder at what other jurisdictions are doing. They're doing what's best for us. And uh, I have to accept that in good faith that they are doing the right thing. But certainly, I can't wait for the bar to open. Maybe I'll go over to Spain, but then I'd have to do 14 days quarantine if I went there, and 14 days when I come back, that wouldn't work. Um, I'd need another haircut. Um, but the, um, the other thing that people are crying out, with the crying out for sport to be reopened, football, GAA, horse racing, uh, and we all look forward to the, the day that when we can go and follow our, our support and support our, our sports. Um, church services, uh, public worship, weddings in churches, a lot of people uh, really feeling very hurt that they, they can't go ahead with a wedding uh, in a church. So, but those are all things that uh, are going to have to be considered on the basis purely of, uh, not of political pressure, but on the basis of uh, uh, scientific and medical advice. And uh, one of the members talked about time scales. Um, you know, it would be nice to have dates and stuff, these things. But really, given the, the nature of this crisis, I don't think we can set anything in stone. We've always got to be flexible, and people have always got to be prepared for a date that they maybe have been given, an indicative date, that that could be changed uh, and that could, that could happen. As regards uh, scientific, I know some members have asked for scientific information we published. I understood that the Department of Health yesterday did publish some information. Maybe the junior minister will confirm that uh, in a summing up. Uh, but I think there was some fairly detailed scientific uh, advice given yesterday. Um, I think also what's important to, to forget uh, that Another outbreak of this virus is a strong possibility. Uh, people are still being uh, infected on a daily basis, and God forbid, but more people may still die from this virus. So, yes? Uh, the member agree with me in picking up um, on, a, on a point by Mr. Frew earlier that actually, in, in, in across industry, and, and it would be related to COVID as well, that the time of greatest risk is often in that transition period when the guard is actually down, so it actually confers that responsibility that we don't act in haste and repent at leisure with such uh, a, a dangerous uh, epidemic that we have. Yep. I think, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'll just uh, finish my remarks by maybe stealing some words uh, from a former local politician, uh, and if he was speaking in relation to this virus, he would be telling you they haven't gone away, you know. Thank you. Oh, Chris Little.
Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I welcome the opportunity to respond uh, to uh, a number of matters relating to the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 4, Regulations 2020. It is my understanding that the Coronavirus Act 2020 Temporary Modification of Education Duties No. 7, Notice Northern Ireland 2020, extends related education regulations from June the 4th for another 28 days, and I would like to speak to those. It is my understanding that these regulations reduce the obligations on a number of statutory authorities, the Education Authority, Health and Social Care Trusts, Boards of Governors and Principals, from a duty to a best endeavour in a number of key areas. The temporary modification of education duties states that the Education Authority reports inadequate resources for special educational needs statutory assessment process, and that the Education Authority Educational Psychology Service has suspended face-to-face -face assessments, and whilst the EPS allows alternatives to face-to-face -face consultation, these alternatives have time implications and must be balanced against the requirement to obtain a professional and, insofar as possible, complete assessment. The Department of Health also reports that social care staff are having difficulty assessing children in suitable clinical environments to enable them to provide reports for this statutory assessment process. Mr Deputy Speaker, I think most MLAs in this Assembly will recognise that this statutory assessment or statementing process is absolutely vital to delivering essential and legally entitled access to support services for children with special educational needs in our community. So I would ask the Executive Office Ministers today what impact this modification is having on special educational needs pupils in our community. Indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker, in Learning Disability Week, uh, I would ask again for the second time in this Assembly that the Education Minister give a detailed statement to this Assembly with regards to the support services that are in place during these restrictions um, for children with special educational needs in our community. Can I draw the member back to this legislation which is removing restrictions? Yes, Mr Speaker. I am obviously commenting in relation to the regulations that, these, that this legislation extends also for another 28 days. I, I would consider that to be of significant relevance. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, the Northern Ireland Executive Coronavirus Recovery Plan, Step Zero, says that such support services are in place for children with special educational needs. And again, I would call on those support services to be outlined in detail in this House. Um, we also uh, have provided for the extension of free school meal payments, and Alliance is clear that this must be extended this summer, and the Executive must work to ensure that the right to food is available to all children at all times in Northern Ireland, particularly during the coronavirus pandemic. I pay tribute, as other MLAs have, to the work of children in Northern Ireland, who are secretariat to the all-party group on children and young people, um, the, who conducted an inquiry into holiday hunger that uh, were mentioned earlier by other MLAs, and of course to Marcus Rashford, who appears to have forced the hand of the UK Prime Minister in relation to this matter. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Education Minister has announced an August 17th date for a return to school and a, a release of restrictions. Um, however, uh, it is my opinion that the focus of the Education Minister ought to be on June the 17th and the urgent need to deliver guidance to schools on social distancing, PPE and what curriculum would look like. I would ask, therefore, the Executive Office Ministers um, what the Chief Scientific Officer and the Chief Medical Officer advice is on social distancing in schools, and whether this advice will be published in advance of the Assembly debate on this matter next week. There is obviously, as other MLAs have mentioned, Mr Deputy Speaker, significant pressure on childcare as a result of restrictions, uh, not, not least uh, in terms of access to uh, funding. And indeed, it is of some concern that approximately 50 to 60 per cent 
of childcare settings have applied for the coronavirus childcare support scheme, and only £600,000 approximately has been allocated of, of £12 million. Um, we would also seek uh, a detailed minister for the statement as to how restrictions relating to childcare will be eased going forward, particularly in relation to which parents and guardians are eligible to access childcare, and that hopefully sooner rather than later will be brought into line with those parents and guardians that are eligible to return to work. That statement should also make clear that childminders are key workers. Uh, and Would the member give way? Pathway. I, I, I try to draw the member back to the regulation. And the member is not mentioning the regulation. He is talking about lots of other areas which are important, and I am giving a little bit of latitude for everyone to do so. But I wish to draw you back to the regulation. You have had a considerable period of time talking about subjects you want to talk about. I am asking you again to come back to the regulation that is in front of us in this legislation, and you are drawing my patience then. Okay. I have mentioned restrictions on a number of occasions. I will be interested to watch this debate back, to be honest with you, to see how I differ from other contributions, if I am honest. Yeah, fine. And I will afford him one last opportunity to contribute to this debate. Mr Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. In terms of uh, my concluding remarks on childcare, then, um, I think the the restrictions created with regards to informal childcare provision by grandparents is also in need of urgent consideration as well, as has been mentioned by other MLAs also. Um, I think, Deputy Speaker, families are increasingly confused that they can take uh, kids to uh, childminders, but they can't take those grandchildren to grandparents. Other MLAs have also mentioned sports. And indeed, that's a matter that I would like to speak to as well, Deputy Speaker. Um, step two, or sorry, we have already, the Executive Office has already outlined uh, permission for outdoor gatherings of up to 10 people. Um, but the Executive Office has not yet, as far as I'm aware, permitted the step two resumption of non contact small group team sports training. And indeed, grassroots sport including uh, my own sport of football across Northern Ireland, uh, has a, a degree, uh, a need for information and clarity in relation to that particu particular issue as to if and in what way it can resume non-contact small group team sports training. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, in, in conclusion, then, um, I would thank the people of Northern Ireland for the vital role that they continue to play by complying with the coronavirus restrictions. They are protecting our NHS that has served us invaluably. They are saving lives of loved ones across Northern Ireland. And it is, however, vital that the same care with which people have applied themselves to lockdown restrictions is applied to the measures that are in place that will allow us to safely ease the extent of that lockdown that has saved so many lives. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I call Jim Allister. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, I understand because of the drip feed nature of these changes, I well understand the necessity for you, Deputy Speaker, to allow some latitude because here we are debating Amendment Number Four. And in fact, we've already probably had twice that number. And so naturally, the, because none of these amendments are an island, I think it is right that you are allowing the latitude that you are. On the concept of them being drip-fed to us, is that coincidence or is that by design? Does that serve the purpose? of an executive anxious to establish credibility in his early days, trying to escape the cloud of RHI? Does it serve a purpose to keep the public on a string, hanging on their every word about when the next amendment will come? Or is that mere coincidence? I think it's more likely to be the former. Uh, and in pursuit of that, of course, We've had that played out before us. One day we're told 
retail shops can open. And then, to keep the public, we then say in a couple of days, you can now have shopping centres. One day we say, you can have a fair weather wedding, but you rely on us, the executive, as to whether you can, when you can have an indoor wedding. Even though the contradiction is plain, you can have an indoor funeral in a church, you can't have an indoor wedding. Well, public and public, we, the executive, will tell you when you can do that. I think there's a bit of that going on here. I do have to say, I think there is politics in it. You know, I, I heard Mr. Chambers saying he accepted and was glad that we weren't following anyone else's lead on these matters, aren't we? Didn't this executive announce that hotels would open on the 20th of July? And didn't Mr. Leo Varadkar then steal a march on them and pull it back, in his case, to the end of June? And lo and behold, suddenly, the science allowed us to open our hotels on the 3rd of July. The public are not fools, Mr. Deputy Speaker. They can see the politics at play in much of this. And the public also know that they're being played. You know, the best case scenario never made available to them. Why? Because we wanted to scare the public. Couldn't tell them. We also had a best case scenario. We're told through the promptings of the Nolan Show that all the parties now agree the medical advice, the medical advice can be released. Where is it? Still hidden. The R number? You know, it's now a range. We don't know if it's the range over the week, if it's the range on a particular day. We don't want the public to know too much because they might get more discontented. I think there's some of that going on. Yes, I'll give away. Thank the member uh, for giving way. Would the member accept that in delivering um, life and death message, messages like I would have had to do with fire safety messaging, that there is no best case scenario when you're dealing with matters of life and death and public safety, and that in this matter, the executive's decision and the health minister's decision was actually the right one because it was maximising the amount of lives that would be saved by taking that line of action? That's a, a perfectly legitimate view. But the fact remains, we had an executive which had two scenarios. It chose to tell us about the worst case. Now, remind the House, these regulations were all predicated on a national picture of half a million deaths. Happily, there's been nothing like that. In Northern Ireland, we were told 15,000 deaths. Happily, nothing like that. There was a scenario which was much more akin to where we actually are, but it was concealed from the public. So, you know, you cannot make a virtue out of saying we're going to tell you what the worst case scenario is, while at the same time concealing something as relevant as the best case scenario. Yes? Giving way, since we're talking about um, scenarios um, that, that were outlined in public, would he um, note that the chief medical officer, or actually the chief scientific officer in England, Patrick Valance, um, said that uh, the UK would get off? I think he said it would be a good outcome; would be 20,000 deaths. Clearly, the UK has unfortunately far exceeded that num those number of deaths. So, will he acknowledge the fact that sometimes these estimates are um, perhaps you know worth it's worth thinking about them very carefully in terms of what's put out in the public domain? That. I think they demonstrate the fact that they are very often guesstimates. Uh, and indeed, in, in, in the UK, we were told the worst case scenario was 500,000 deaths. Uh, other people said 20, other people said more. And sadly, we're at 40. Uh, and none of that is to be dismissed or talked down. It's serious. But, you know, we are at a point where happily today, there was only one death. Happily today, there were only two new cases. And that has essentially been the picture over the past week. That's 
that's a good situation to be in. But that also makes the point, you know, the easements have to therefore come. And making a virtue out of the inevitable has become something of an art form with this executive. It's inevitable that these restrictions are eased uh, uh, because of the statistics which inform the reality of the situation. Mr. Deputy Speaker, there are a couple of specifics I'd like some enlightenment upon. When we last debated these matters, I raised the issue of um, drive-in church services. And I went through the legislation as to what it might mean. The junior minister, in replying to my question, said, drive-in church services are permitted only on premises belonging to the place of worship. Now, I'd like the other junior minister, in replying today, to tell us, is that still the executive view, that drive-in church services are permitted only on premises belonging to the place of worship? Because, uh, as Ms. Bradshaw related to us, we all know, without public harm, there are drive-in services taking place in other locations. Therefore, what is it? Is it enough if the organisers can control the venue, or does the venue have to be the actual premises? I think churches and those of that interest are entitled to an emphatic a declaration from the executive that's up to date, because, because the last time we had a declaration from the other junior minister which really put the kibosh on the thought that you could have the very sort of thing that Ms. Bradshaw uh, illustrated. Yes? Several drive-in church services taking place in my con or constituency, as one we, we, which we share, where they are perfectly safe. And, and again, what is the ownership issue got to do with health and science? It really is uh, it needs clarified. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, I'm looking for the flexibility that's there. Uh, I, just on that, could I make? That's a slightly technical point, but I, I am a bit surprised that when it came to drive-in cinemas, we went through the right process of amending a regulation a, for six, I think it was. Yes, by adding, sorry, by, by amending the, the relevant regulation, whose number I've misplaced, uh, to say that drive-in uh, cinemas were an exception to the use of the premises. We didn't do the same in respect of churches. Why not? Uh, I would have thought it's a drafting issue which should have been paralleled in the two. Just on that theme of churches, could I seek some clarification from the junior minister? In step three, it says that in regards to family and community, gatherings can accommodate up to 30 people while maintaining social distancing. I take it those are inside as well as outside gatherings. If you confirm that. So are those indoor gatherings as well as outdoor gatherings? And how does that affect churches? Does that mean, for example, that a small church congregation, which might have a midweek meeting where 30 might be more than enough, does that mean they can meet in those circumstances when we come to step three without waiting for step four? Or are those, is that situation trumped by regulation four or five? which says a person who is responsible for a place of worship must ensure during the emergency the place of worship is closed, except for the permitted uses, funeral, etc., uh, etc. Et so are we in a situation where under step three, the one group which will have no benefit from step three gatherings of 30 or more people are in fact churches? because churches 
by Regulation 4 are required to be closed. So we could have a situation then perhaps where Larne DUP could meet as a gathering of 30 people, but a church, and not the last I heard, <laughs> but, but a church couldn't hold a small service like that. So those are the sort of irregularities that jump out of me in terms of these regulations uh, uh, at me. And therefore, I would ask the junior minister if he'd address, first of all, the drive-in situation, beyond clarity, beyond doubt, and the situation as to whether the step three gatherings of 30 people are A, indoors, and B, does it apply to everywhere except churches? Thank you. I call Jerry Carl. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I have to raise some serious concerns about the process here, uh, and these concerns you'd be glad to hear relate directly to Amendment Number Four uh, under discussion uh, this afternoon. Uh, because despite having uh, wi widespread and uh, the draconian emergency powers throughout this crisis, uh, the executive and the justice minister um, have so far um, exercised these powers not against employers who risk workers' lives or car homeowners who put people in danger. Instead, they have exercised them primarily against black and BAME protesters who took part recently in a uh, responsible and socially distant uh, event. Uh, this is directly related, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to Amendment Number Four, which we are discussing because it relates to outdoor gatherings. Uh, for months, we were told there were no police enforcement powers attached to outdoor gatherings. Indeed, when this amendment we are discussing today went through, there were also no powers for enforcement, despite what Junior Minister Kearney says. It was only afterward and prior to Black Lives Matter protests, 24, less than 24 hours. I will indeed, yeah. Would it not be correct that um, under Regulation 6 they would have had the powers for, for two people and it was only whenever it was changed the day before that it became um, crowds up to six? So in many ways it would have been more restrictive if they hadn't updated the regulations? Uh, I thank the member for intervention, but I would refer to Amnesty International and the CAGA's um, comments on this, and I'll come on to that in a second, who actually say that uh, and back up the fact that it was, it was the 5th of June, the day before uh, the protests happened, when the enforcement powers were, were brought in. Um, and, and some of this may seem technical, Mr Deputy Speaker, but it's worth going into detail because it is, in, in fact, highly political. Um, and as you may know, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Executive does have legal authority to bypass Assembly approval if there are reasons of urgency under Section uh, 25Q, uh, the emergency procedure. And I would question such powers at any time. Uh, but my point is that both recent amendments to Health Regulations No. 4 and 5 relied on this process. Both amendments relate to outdoor gatherings, but there were no powers of enforcement in existence for police to fine or prosecute people. And then, suddenly, on the 5th of June, uh, we met, witnessed a last-minute amendment, uh, number five, uh, which granted enforcement powers in order to restrict protests in Belfast and Derry. This begs the question, Mr. Deputy Speaker, why did the Department not consider it necessary, by a matter of urgency, uh, to include police enforcement powers at the time of amendment number four, which was passed on the 21st of May? No such provision was included on the amendment being discussed today, but it was then rushed through just weeks later, uh, on the eve of anti-racist uh, protests and events. And as the Committee for uh, the Administration of Justice and Amnesty International have pointed out, there seem to be two possible explanations. The first, and uh, less believable in my view, uh, is that it was just a coincidence in which these enforcement powers were uh, unlawful, because a coincidence uh, does not constitute an emergency. The second explanation, uh, and I would suggest the more likely one, was that these powers were explicitly introduced in order to tackle Black Lives Matter protests. And if this is true, it represents uh, the real possibility of discrimination against our BAME community. There were no powers of enforcement attached to this amendment regarding potential breaches in respect of outdoor cinemas. Indeed, there were no powers of enforcement in existence then to tackle IKEA queues or workplace gatherings and any matter of uh, other gatherings and social events. Uh, so I think in, in conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, 
when Amendment Number Five comes up for vote in this chamber, um, I think we should vote against it. I think uh, all MLAs should reject it uh, and raise concern about how it represented and is a discriminatory attack on the BME community to gather in a socially uh, distant and responsible way. Uh, and until then, I do want to know uh, what the rationale was, if the junior minister can answer this question, what was the rationale for not introducing enforcement powers uh, for this current amendment that we're discussing today, and instead, why, uh, did the, um, why, why was there a wait until Friday the 5th of June before it was uh, uh, introduced? Um, and I suspect a truthful answer to this question may speak volumes about the disgraceful treatment that the BAME community has witnessed uh, in the last few weeks. Thank you. I now call on Gordon Lyons, the junior minister, to conclude and wind up the debate on the motion. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I thank members for their contributions today. As Minister Kearney has said, this is the fourth time we have come to this chamber in relation to these regulations. And each time that we have returned, we have been able to bring before the House a further relaxation of these regulations. We have been able to do this because the people of Northern Ireland have adhered to the rules that were put in place. And with few exceptions, the compliance has been incredible. We have asked people to stay away from their families, their friends, their jobs, their places of worship. We have asked people to refrain from doing so much of what before the crisis was a normal part of everyday life. So it is right that we acknowledge the part that individuals have played in saving lives, but it's also important that we remind people that we are not out of the woods yet. We are still depending on people to follow the restrictions that do remain in place, to observe social distancing and maintain good hygiene. Those measures are still critical in our efforts to save lives. However, we must not become complacent about these restrictions and they must not be allowed to become the norm. Although the statutory requirement is for a review of the measures at least every 21 days, the reality is that the executive continues to review them on a constant basis and will not hesitate to make changes when the scientific and expert medical advice allows for that to happen. The executive approach to decision-making document remains our blueprint for the review process, and the incremental structure for assessing progress contained within the document will help decision-making in key areas. There will be more relaxation to come in the days and weeks ahead as we ease forward on the pathway to recovery. I would now like to turn, though, to some of the points that members have made during the debate today, and I'm going to try and uh, focus um, on the particular um, aspects that are, are relevant to the amendment regulations uh, at the centre of today's debate. To begin with, the uh, Chair of the Executive Office Committee, Mr McGrath, rightly drew attention to the mental health impacts uh, that this virus um, and these regulations are having on people here uh, in Northern Ireland. We know, we're fully aware that that is a, a huge issue. That's why it is good that we're able to come here when we can uh, and put those relaxations uh, in place. So we do uh, thank him for his uh, support and for his reinforcement um, of the um, need to continue to practice uh, social distancing. We welcome also his support for the indicative timescales, but we emphasise that those are conditional. They depend on maintaining the progress that we have made on the fight against the disease, something that we all have the opportunity to influence uh, by our behaviour. Uh, I accept what he says in relation to um, these uh, debates, and a number of members have made this point, uh, about the debates taking place uh, weeks um, after these amendments have, have been made. And we know, I think we're now on to the eighth set of amendment, which means we'll be coming here at least uh, another uh, four times. However, many members um, have talked before about the importance of, of the uh, Assembly Committees having um, the ability to view uh, and look at these regulations before, and that's why it is important that they do go to committees first um, before they come to this House. Just on the point that he made in relation to the announcements um, of the easing uh, of, of restrictions, he says, what, why are they not coming to the House first? Uh, why are we announcing them uh, in the press uh, beforehand? Well, the case is that the regulations are very clear. They state, as soon as the Department of Health considers that any restrictions or requirements set out in these regulations are no longer necessary, the Department of Health must publish a direction 
terminating that restriction or requirement. We hear that everybody um, saying that we don't want these uh, regulations in uh, a minute longer than, than they need to be. And so when the Department of Health determines that they're no longer necessary, we make that decision oh, and we announce that. And that's why perhaps it's not coming to the Assembly as quick as some members uh, might like. Uh, the member, uh, along with Mr Chambers, and I think some other mentioned uh, the need to get hairdressers uh, operating again. Uh, that is something that I get told on a, on a daily basis from people. They say, when are hairdressers uh, opening up again? Uh, they don't always need to tell me that, of course, because some truths are self-evident, uh, and I'll say nothing more uh, on that, but uh, I know that people want to see those changes uh, made, and uh, we will do that as soon um, as that is possible. Uh, Mr Gilder, you um, had made some comments in relation to test uh, and trace, and the department has, of course, as he will be aware, uh, prepared a COVID-19 strategy on test, trace and protect, which sets out the public health approach to minimising COVID-19 transmission in the community uh, in Northern Ireland. And the key elements are testing all people with symptoms of COVID-19, contact tracing, providing information and advice on self-isolation, and support to enable people to self-isolate. Department of Health officials are working closely with officials in the rest of the UK and in the Republic of Ireland to understand their approaches, uh, align where appropriate, and share learning uh, and tools. And of course, support from the public will be absolutely critical uh, in order for that uh, to be effective. Uh, Pam Cameron uh, had uh, welcomed um, the cautious and incremental approach uh, taken by the executive, and I, I agree with her uh, on the importance of, of restoring the economy and the delivery um, of health and social care um, in, in particular, uh, and the need um, for us to make sure that people that are getting that care and support that they need are actually getting it, and COVID isn't restricting that. And I do note the comments that she's made uh, as well in terms of visiting those um, in, in care homes or in hospital uh, type settings. Uh, that's a matter, obviously, for the, the Department of Health, but. I'm happy to pass that on uh, to the Minister uh, uh, as well. Um, I, I, do, I do want to pick up on, on the comment that she had made in, in relation to the 35 attacks that took place, I think in one week, uh, against the ambulance service. And I think that all members here can agree uh, that that's absolutely abhorrent uh, that such a thing is taking place. These are the people um, that are the, they're the first responders, the first on the scene, uh, providing that critical care um, to people and they deserve our respect, they deserve our admiration, uh, they do not um, uh, deserve um, some of the uh, attacks uh, uh, or, or the attacks that have been taking place, uh, and that, that, that's absolutely uh, abhorrent. In regards to, to shielding, um, the advice remains current, and anyone advised to shield by their GP or hospital specialist should continue to do so uh, until advised otherwise. And as announced on the 1st of June, from Monday the 8th of June, provided the rate of COVID-19 infection allows, those who are shielding will be able to spend time outside with people uh, from their own household um, or, or a person from another household uh, whilst ensuring um, social uh, distancing. And the, four, um, the UK's four chief medical officers uh, are leading work at a national level to carefully assess uh, what needs to be done to continue to protect people who are uh, extremely uh, vulnerable. Uh, Pat Sheehan began um, by saying that he was going to stick to the regulations and then went on to discuss COVID at the border, phone apps, test traced and isolating policy, case diagnosis in New Zealand and the upsurge in China. Um, so I don't think there's anything left for me to say other than to congratulate the member on being able to test the uh, patience uh, of the Deputy Speaker uh, just about to, to the limit. Though he did mention face coverings, and it is recommended that you should think about using face coverings in particular circumstances, uh, short periods in closed spaces where social distancing is not possible. In practice, these circumstances will largely mean on public transport uh, and in shops, but the use uh, of face coverings is not currently mandatory. Uh, crucially, people should not get a false sense of security about the level of protection provided by wearing a face covering. Uh, it's essential that everyone continues to practice social distancing uh, as much as possible, wash their hands thoroughly, catch it, kill it, uh, bin it when they sneeze uh, or cough.
If the member is going to stick to the regulations, I'm happy to. to get I, I, I'm just, I'm just responding. Thank you for giving way. I'm, I'm just responding to the comments you've just made about face coverings or face masks, whichever term you want to use. And uh, the chief scientific officer gave evidence to the committee uh, the week before last there, and uh, in a comment uh, very near the, the final stages of the committee, he said. He's slightly disconcerted when he goes into a shop uh, and he's the only one wearing a face mask. So if he's wearing a face mask and he's the chief scientific officer, why is he doing it? Grimaldi. Well, I don't think that we can get ourselves into a position where it is mandatory um, for us to require people um, to, to, to wear face coverings. That's not a route I would want to go down. But I would far rather prefer that people listen to the advice that, that is out there, um, in particular around some of the, the measures that, that I've just uh, already mentioned. That's not particularly a matter for the, for the regulations uh, at this stage, um, but I'm sure that the, the Health Minister and the CMO and CESA will have heard uh, what, you, what, you, what you've said uh, on, the, on those issues. Um, the, uh, next member was, was, was Mike Nesbitt, and I think that he was um, trying to outdo um, Pat Sheehan uh, in staying as far away from, from the regulations uh, as he can. Uh, look, he, he, he rightly reminds us of the importance of a programme uh, for government and issues such as holiday hunger, and I'm pleased um, that, that that announcement has been, has been made uh, today. But he does remind us that there are many effects of, of COVID-19. I've always said this is not just a, a health crisis. Um, it's a non-COVID health crisis as well that people can sometimes forget, and it's a social uh, and economic crisis. I believe it's also an educational crisis uh, as well. All of these things need to be taken into consideration, uh, and no doubt they will when the um, programme for government is, is developed um, over the, the coming months. Uh, the next member um, that, that contributed was uh, Paul Frew. And I uh, have considerable sympathy um, with the member's concern about the delayed opportunity uh, for scrutiny um, by the uh, Assembly. Uh, I have already outlined how things are passed on to, uh, to committees first. Um, however, I do have to say he has certainly taken advantage of the opportunity that he had today within this debate uh, to get his views uh, across. Um, though I do take on board um, the issues that he has raised in relation to some of the inconsistencies that can come up um, as we try to relax these, these restrictions. It was very easy to bring them all in uh, at once. Opening up is a little bit more, more difficult and various members have expressed the concerns that they have uh, in relation to that. And of course, we welcome members getting in contact with us if there are things that they think um, that should be changed uh, or things that don't make sense. We're, we're not going to be opposed to people um, highlighting those uh, issues, uh, especially if, if they are just simply uh, inconsistencies. Uh, he specifically wanted answers on the executive's um, approach to decision-making uh, document. And from the very start, we would said that this was not going to be a, a process that we moved forward in uh, together. Uh, and we said that it may be the case that family and community moves at a slower pace um, than sport or cultural activities. Um, sometimes we might get to step three or step four before we get uh, to, to step one. This was agreed by the executive, including the department, uh, the minister for the department uh, for health. Um, but obviously, we've always said from the start that we need we needed the flexibility that was in this document, uh, and the flexibility that we have uh, means that we're able to to get that advice from uh, from the scientific uh, experts, from the CMO and the CSA. We're able to take that that advice, and, and they've made it clear. Um, the family aspect is, is a lot more difficult. And I can understand people's frustration in that. People can say, well, why, why is it that I can go into a shop and perhaps bump into a member of my family? Why can't I have my family uh, into, my, into my home? Um, of course, the, if, if you're in a shop, uh, the chances are you're not going to be there with them for a prolonged period of time in very close uh, contact, unless you're specifically going for that reason uh, to, to do that. But that close contact within the family, uh, within the home, that temptation um, to, to hug or to get close to your family members uh, may be too great. Uh, and at this time, guided entirely um, uh, by, by what the experts have said on this, we've decided not to progress uh, to that point in that stage. I hope that changes. Uh, I hope it's, it, it's the case um, soon. But that's the process that we have for moving through. And of course, I'll take you back to the point that I made to Mr McGrath. The regulations state that we have to terminate um, 
the regulations as soon as we consider them no longer required to help in the fight against this disease. So I don't want to prevent restaurants uh, from opening if we believe that the risk is low to do so, simply because there's another stage that hasn't been able uh, to catch up uh, with us. The, the member also mentioned uh, childcare. Uh, childcare isn't um, specifically uh, an issue for these uh, regulations, although um, the informal family childcare is, is obviously uh, a factor here. Um, but he will be aware of the wider discussion that is going on within the executive, and the executive um, very much appreciates the difficulty that this is causing uh, for a number of people and a growing number of people as um, we relax restrictions on, on the rest of the economy. And I hope there's going to be positive announcements about that in, in the coming days. I um, want to refer next to the comments made by, by Alan Chambers, and he referred to the relaxation on the ability to travel uh, and described it as a contradiction or unintended uh, consequence. Um, I respectfully uh, disagree with him. This is not a contradiction but a natural consequence of, of the relaxation. As restrictions are relaxed, more and more activities are permitted, and it follows then that people will be able uh, to travel further. And that makes it even more important that we all adopt sensible precautions, uh, good hygiene uh, and, and social uh, distancing. Uh, he also mentioned um, the issue uh, of, of dentists. Uh, and this is something um, that I have um, I had a lot of uh, requests about on a, on a constituency basis. I know a lot of people have gone a long time um, without certain levels of, of, of dental care. There has been progress that has been made in the, in the last week uh, on that, um, but I understand we do need to, to make further uh, and greater progress uh, on that. And I know, and I know it's becoming more of a, of a pressing issue, and the members certainly put that on the record today. Uh, and I will pass those comments on to the Minister uh, for Health uh, also. He also mentioned church services, and I will come to that um, uh, in greater detail whenever I speak to Mr. Alistair's comments. Um, but could I say um, that I think that churches need to be um, commended for the exceptional way in which they have adhered to, to the regulations uh, at this time? I understand the frustration of, of a lot of churches, Mr. Deputy Speaker, who can see shops open, who can see restaurants going to open, um, but they say, well, why can't we meet? It goes back to the point that was made in terms of, of family. Um, you might go into a shop, buy something, uh, and not get very close to, to other people, um, or, or hug or, or greet people. Um, but that may happen uh, in a church situation if you're being reunited with, with folks that you haven't seen uh, for a long time. More of an opportunity, perhaps, uh, for people to mill around uh, as well. But I do understand uh, how important uh, an issue that is for many people. Uh, and many people, their lives, especially perhaps older or retired people, um, their weekly lives are, are anchored within that church family and the church community. And I, I have had examples of how, of how that is affecting the mental health uh, of many people. So we do want to see that addressed. And I'm, I'm pleased um, that the First Minister was able to announce um, the setting up of the working group um, on churches. And that will meet for the first time tomorrow. And I hope um, that we can get good guidelines and recommendations out of that, uh, which will allow uh, for, for the opening. Um, of, of churches. Um, the member also mentioned hairdressers. Uh, this has come up again. I think that shows what an important issue is. The, the member doesn't have to worry. He's, he's looking okay there. Um, but I can understand why many people uh, will want it to be um, will want them to be opened up um, uh, as soon as possible. Um, of course, close contact services such as hairdressers. Um, there is more difficulty there, but it is under active consideration um, by the executive. Um, Mr. Little referred to, uh, I suppose, not, not these regulations, but the associated education uh, regulations. Um, schools aren't really mentioned within the regulations that we have here. In fact, I think the only time schools are mentioned is the requirement to make sure that school canteens uh, are closed. Um, but I fully understand the points he, he, he's making in regards to special educational needs, social distancing in schools. And I'm more than happy to pass that on to the Minister for Education. Um, who will write to the member on, on those issues. Um, he also mentions childcare, which I think I've addressed uh, in my comments to um, Mr. Fru. I want to move on uh, to the comments that were made um, by, um, by, by Mr. Alistair. Uh, he mentioned about releasing the, the scientific and medical advice. Um, that's um, something that I support. I have no issue with that at all. Obviously, it's a, 
an issue for the Department of Health. It's, it, it's their advice. Um, but we have no problem uh, uh, releasing that and making uh, that available. He talked about um, th that we're perhaps being led um, by, by other jurisdictions. We're very clear. Uh, we have not made um, these reasons uh, or these decisions for any other reasons that the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Officer have said, this is, this is acceptable, this is, this is going to be okay uh, for, for us to do. The member later on talked about the need for us to, to ease restrictions and to open things up. Um, so I, I hope that he, he, will, he will welcome the fact um, that this is allowed. He had previously mentioned to me about caravans, uh, and I hope that he's content with the, with the changes um, that are going to be uh, made there uh, as well. The, the member specifically raised um, a number of issues in regards to uh, churches, and I want to address those uh, now. So, first of all, uh, when the regulations were originally brought in, it mandated that a place of worship be closed. We subsequently amended those regulations to allow that a drive-in service could take place on that place of worship's premises. Um, so that has now been changed and people are allowed to have their drive-in services on their premise. And then we get the question that Mr. Alistair and many others have raised, which is in relation to a drive-in church or drive-in service taking place somewhere other than the place of worship's um, own property. If a service of that type is taking place outside of a place of worship's property, then it doesn't actually fall under the restrictions. It, it doesn't come under the, the regulations in, terms, um, uh, in the terms that we were, we were speaking of. Um, the only way it might fall under the regulations is in terms of the regulation five, the, the reason for traveling. Um, but you need to have a reasonable excuse. But if it is a reasonable excuse uh, to travel to a place of worship, to attend a drive-in service on their premises, then surely it would follow that it's a reasonable excuse uh, to attend a plate, to attend a service outside of that of that property. Now, it may be the case that that needs to be um, completely clarified in the regulations, uh, which we would be we would be happy to do. Um, but there is a distinction between those that were originally mandated to shut, those are, that are no longer, uh, or that were never mandated uh, to shut uh, at all, and therefore um, any organisation. Uh, would be free um, uh, to do such a to do such a thing. I want to move on also to the. Yes, he says that um, it could technically be a breach of Regulation Five about uh, travel, but is there not also a problem with Regulation Six and the number of people gathering outside? Uh, if he's going to amend to put in an exception for drive-in churches, does he not need to amend both? Regulation five and six. Um, I, I don't think there, there would be a problem for us to bring forward those amendments to the regulations. However, I don't think that a drive-in service would necessarily constitute uh, an outdoor uh, gathering. Um, I, 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 um, I would be happy to get that clarified uh, for the member, but obviously it's a very different setup if people are coming uh, in, in their in their cars. I don't think anybody would count a, a traffic jam somewhere as an outdoor as an outdoor gathering. But I think it is important that we look at these regulations and see how they could be could be amended if necessary to provide um, uh, people the, the comfort that they are looking for. The other issue that he raised then was in relation to gatherings of up to 30 people under step uh, three, and I would refer the member to the executive's decision-making document. Uh, it does say in step three, gatherings can accommodate up to 30 people while maintaining social distancing. Uh, but if you look down at the definition of the steps in the, uh, in the bottom box, it says um, that that includes indoor activities involving larger number of individuals where social distancing can be maintained for individuals who do not share a household connection. So that would follow, um, surely, that a church, a midweek prayer meeting perhaps, or a smaller church service uh, could happen. Um, now the number for the indoor congregations there aren't specifically uh, mentioned, um, but I think that that would fall in to that category. However, the member then raises the question of whether that would be permitted under the regulations. However, if we're going to get to step three and say that this is uh, going to be appropriate to take place, then it would, re it would require an amendment to the regulations, and we're now able to make sure 
that that happens uh, and, and that that's part of it. And I thank the member uh, for, his, for his questions. Um, our final speaker was um, Mr. Carl. And um, Mr. Carl had, had mentioned um, the, the changes that took place uh, within the regulations and uh, seemed to suggest that there was a, that there was a conspiracy uh, going on here and that we had uh, intentionally brought in changes to, to regulations um, to allow enforcement uh, at a Black uh, Lives Matter uh, protest. Uh, let me make clear um, uh, the sequencing and the timeline uh, of what took place. Regulation 6, which relates solely to a gathering in a public place of more than two people, has never been repealed. Accordingly, there has been no interruption to the enforcement powers relating to public gatherings for which Regulation 6 provides. Regulation 6A was intended to be a concession in respect of families and friends who do not live in the same household. It is also worth noting that whilst Regulation 6A applies to outdoor gatherings, it also covers gatherings in a private outdoor place such as a private garden. A drafting error in the Amendment No. 3 regulations, which came into operation on the at 11 p.m. on the 19th of May, meant that it was not an offence to breach the restriction in Regulation 6A relating to outdoor gatherings of up to six people. The omission was noticed and corrected on the same day by way of a technical amendment included in the Amendment No. 5 regulations, which came into operation at 11 p.m. on the 5th of June. I understand that the amendments had the effect of putting the PSNI in the position they thought they had already been in with regard to Regulation 6A from the evening of the 19th of May, since they were unaware of the drafting error, error until it was drawn to their attention on the afternoon of the 5th of June. I am also advised that no fixed penalty notices were issued for breach of Regulation 6A by the PSNI during the period in question. The Department of Health was simply using the opportunity of the Amendment No. 5 regulations to make a technical correction to a previous drafting error. The timing of the Black Lives Matter protest was purely coincidental, but the enforcement of the regulations is a matter for the PSNI. All that I can say to the Honourable Member is that the regulations themselves um, have, been, have been clear. The enforcement issue uh, is separate. But the, regu the, the effect of the regulations um, uh, on movement of people uh, hadn't changed and that they uh, were still uh, in place. And I hope that that clarifies uh, the issue uh, for, for the member. Yes. Uh, would the minister agree that in the middle of this current pandemic, that it's really ill-advised uh, for any group of people uh, to hold uh, a, a public protest like what we have seen in recent days, no matter how justified the cause and how supportive I personally would be of those protests. Thank you. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's not only ill-advised to take part in such public protests, it's against the regulations themselves. Uh, I'll give way. Mr Minister, for giving way. Does the Minister not express concern that uh, one group of people gathering in a socially distant way are being threatened with prosecution and fine, and another group of people who seemingly aren't socially distancing, namely, say, Belfast City Hall, aren't treated in the same way? Does that not concern the Minister? Um, Mr um, Deputy Speaker, uh, this is obviously an issue for the PSNI, but let me say this. Uh, I believe that we are all equal under the law and equally subject to the law. I believe that there needs to be consistency in how issues are approached. Um, now, obviously, um, there, there, there may be different approaches that the police take uh, at different times, depending on the nature uh, of the event. That's an issue for the police. That's an issue for you to raise with the, with the policing board, with the chief constable, or with the police ombudsman, if the member does not believe um, that these issues have been dealt with uh, in the appropriate way. Um, but it's my job here today to say this, this is what the regulations say. Uh, and, and, and to, to finish my answer to Mr. Mr. Chamber's question, public protests or demonstrations um, of a number more than 10 are not permitted at this time, regardless uh, of how good the cause might be, regardless of how much uh, we may support it. Because here's the thing, I know people that have had to give up going to the funeral of a loved one. I know someone uh, that hasn't been able uh, to have the wedding that they had originally planned. 
Uh, we've all heard the stories about people that are, are missing uh, their friends and their family and can't meet up uh, in that way. So I have huge support um, uh, for, for some of the protests uh, and demonstrations that some people might like uh, to take place and to see happen. However, we need to realise these regulations are in place for a reason. We're not here just for the banter. We're here because we're trying uh, to save lives. Uh, we're here because we're trying to do uh, the right thing. And I think it's really important that people adhere to that. I'll give way to uh, I, I appreciate the Minister uh, giving way on, on these matters. I'm just seeing some clarity on, on a point he raised. Uh, uh, he said that the regulations hadn't been used during that period. Does that include the Black Lives Matter protest? Was there a different a regulation used to issue fines at that protest, or was the regulation we're currently discussing between us at this stage uh, used at that protest? I'm just seeking clarity on that matter. Uh, yes, it's my understanding that the same regulation, the, the changes that took place were brought in at 11 p.m. on the 5th of June, and that took place before the, um, the, two, the two protests I think that members are, are, are alluding to uh, today. There was no difference. I don't want to, to stray away um, uh, from that, um, but I hope that that answers uh, the questions that most members uh, have, have asked uh, today, and if there's anything else, of course, that I've missed, we, the department will respond uh, in, in writing. Before I finish, though, I do want to once more take this opportunity uh, to thank those who have done so much for us during these unprecedented uh, and strange times. Of course, I start with our wonderful health uh, and social care staff. Although our clapping on Thursday evenings may have stopped, uh, our gratitude uh, continues. Uh, their efforts and sacrifices have not gone unnoticed, uh, and we thank them for the professional uh, and caring way in which they have done uh, their job. However, I also want to, to thank others who have kept us going uh, during this crisis. The council workers uh, and civil servants who have kept providing essential public services. Our farmers and all of those in the agri-food sector who uh, ensure that we have uh, enough to eat. Uh, those who have provided public transport and taxis so that key workers can get around. All those in retail and in delivery who have kept us supplied, those in energy and utilities who have kept the power on uh, and the water flowing, and thousands of others who have worked so hard. We thank them all. Mr Deputy Speaker, I hope that we will be able to keep coming back here with further relaxations. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I commend the regulations to the Assembly. I now remember the question uh, regarding the regulations. The question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Re Restrictions Amendment No. 4, Regulations of Northern Ireland 2020, that's a mouthful, be approved. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. I would ask members to just take their ease for a few moments.